Most of all, sisters and brothers, brothers and sisters, we come now at this time in this way, thinking about honoring Mother Earth. And on this day, you know, this is Columbus Day weekend, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit and what that means in the context of treating the Mother Earth and our environment and ourselves in a good way, treating the people in a good way. And so uh, we're going to call upon you now to open your uh, Bibles if you have them here. Turn them to the Hebrew Bible, uh, Numbers 35, 33 through 34. We're going to use three different texts today, all from the Hebrew Bible. These first two I'm going to do now, and then later on I'm going to have another one. So, Numbers 35, 33 through 34. You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, and no expiation can be made for the land. For the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in which I also dwell. For I, your God, dwell <coughs> among the Israelites. And then we're going to go to Proverbs 12, 10. Yep, Proverbs 12, 10, and this is a short verse, which is okay. The righteous know the need of their animals, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Doing right by our home is doing right by ourselves and our Creator. Now, imagine if you will for a minute, what if God came knocking on your front door and walked into your house, sat down? Would you trash your house in the presence of God? Would you? Would you? And yet, we have many people here in North America and around the world who do not think about the fact that God dwells on earth and in the earth and all around us. And when we look at numbers, which I'm going to back up to numbers, we look at the historical context here. First and foremost, we have to keep in mind that numbers, like Ecclesiastes, is a law book. It's a book of rules and regulations set down by Moses to kind of help bring commonality and unity, cultural identity, to the Jewish people, to the Israelites, who, after leaving Egypt, uh, basically didn't have a culture of their own as much so as they had a multicultural. And there were a lot of commonalities among the different cultures in that region during that time period. Canaanites, Ubanites, whoever, and the Egyptians, they're all very similar in culture. And so part of establishing identity comes from creating your own culture. This is the culture of our family. This is the culture of our community. This is the culture of our nation. Here in the United States, we live in the melting pot, where there are many nations, many cultures, intermingling, intersharing, living here. But we also still have different cultural norms and standards which still separate us from one group to the other, distinguish us from one another. Even among American Indians, there are a lot of commonalities in culture among the over 550 nations in North America. And yet, there are different distinctions, both in language, in behavior, and in uh, choice you know, things that we do, songs that we sing, that uh, distinguish us from one nation to the next. 
And so when we think about this, we think about how uh, Moses was establishing culture and identity. So in this passage, what came before it is basically Moses is talking about what happens when you murder one another. He's trying to explain to the Israelites it's not okay to kill your own people. Because, as God says, the blood of your brothers and sisters pollutes the land. And when you pollute the land with blood, you're polluting God's house. Because, basically, the earth belongs to God. All of creation belongs to God. We are here out of God's grace. God's support for us to have the opportunity to grow and evolve as spiritual beings and as human beings in a good and healthy way. Whether we choose to do that or not, that's up to us. And when we think about this text, we think about where, especially verse 34, what does it mean when God says, I dwell with the Israelites? Well, who are the Israelites? By the time Moses wrote this, he believed the Israelites were <coughs> a bunch of people he brought out of Egypt and were hanging around with him in the desert. That's who he thought the Israelites were. That's who he was supporting. That's who he was taking care of. That's who he was the messenger to. But according to Christ, according to Jesus, what we see in the, Hebrew, in the New Testament, in the life of Christ, especially in the teachings of Paul, is that all human beings who believe are Israelites. Or, to put it another way, children of God. I have no Jewish heritage that I know of. There are many commonalities between Cherokee language and Hebrew language. Many words are the same. Many Hebrews believe that American Indians are the lost 13th tribe or something of the Israelites. There is that theory. And so we look at that and we, we know that uh, these commonalities that, that exist bind us together in some way. But in spirit, it is true. All human beings were created by God and all human beings are children of God. So as such, we believe in our Indian religious tradition that God lives in us, around us, and in all things. The winged ones, the two legged, the four legged, those who crawl upon the earth, in the earth, those are standing people, water people, fire people, stone people, star people, all creation. God's here. We don't think about it because we don't focus on God's presence all day long. When we're at work, we're thinking about other people. We're thinking about profit. We're thinking about service. In the jobs that we do. And, unfortunately, many people driving down the road, goes on that beer bottle, tossing the bottle out the window, aren't thinking about their neighbors or the environment. They're not thinking about the folks who are riding around the streets where I live in horse and carriage and how those beer bottles can cut the animal's foot, cause infection, and maybe even kill the animal. For example, I lived in New Mexico for 14 years, north central New Mexico. That's where Four Winds and Native American Ministry started out there at Skidobi. And from that came Sacred Hood, because I affiliated with the disciples. And uh, one of the worst challenges I had up there were how the people, because of the poverty in the land, disrespected the sacredness of the land. Garbage everywhere. Broken beer bottles and cans in pastures left and right. Driving around it all day long. Downtown, just outside downtown Taos, fields full of broken glass because of all the beer bottles and stuff over the years gathering and horses and cows standing out there trying to eat grass. And you wonder, what is wrong with these people? But well, what's wrong with them 
is a lack of respect for themselves. A lack of respect for oneself means a lack of respect for others and for the environment, for our own home. Those who exploit the land without consideration for the long-term consequences have no respect for themselves, for their families, for their community. They think only of themselves what they can get in the moment. And that short-sightedness, mean-spiritedness, is cruelty. And how do we know this? How can we judge this? For it is a judgment. We turn to Proverbs. Proverbs 12, 10. Clearly tells us that from God's point of view, from God's perspective, you can tell a person by how they treat their enemies. You can tell a person's character by how they treat the world in which they live. It's pretty point blank. As God says, and this is God saying this, God says the righteous know the needs of their animals, which means they're compassionate, they're empathetic, caring, they're paying attention to others and not just themselves, even their animals. We're not talking about the kids and the family and their neighbors. Because you think they would be thinking about their neighbors and their family as much as themselves. Those who have no respect in their heart for themselves have no respect for others. All they see is a bunch of exploitable resources around them. People, plants, animals, minerals, air, water, whatever you can think about. They don't see something that needs to be cherished, needs to be valued. They see it as an exploitable resource. But the mercy of the wicked is cruel. So what comes from the heart of a person who does not have respect for themselves is abuse and exploitation and oppression. And that comes from cultural influence of the doctrine of Christian discovery. 500 years ago when the papal bulls came out saying that Christians are morally superior to everything and everybody and we don't have to worry about it. And it goes even farther back than that. It goes back to Genesis, back to Moses. And Moses kind of contradicts himself a bit. You might think, but not so. It goes back to Genesis chapter 1, verses oh, 24 through 28, I believe. Let me get to that page. I'll have it marked in the yellow. So if you turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 to 28, I'm going to read a story that you're all probably very familiar with, I'm sure, especially uh, in this context. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things of wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind, and God saw that it was good. God likes what God creates. Imagine that. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created the humankind in his image, and in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have the dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So, Many people interpret over the generations, and I've read other commentaries on this, that uh, that word dominion isn't exactly 
what it's supposed to mean in the English word. But there is some debate over whether it shall have uh, uh, power over or shall be responsible for. Because having dominion over something is meaning that you are now the caretaker. You're responsible for what happens to whatever is out there, whatever you have dominion over. If it thrives, it's your responsibility. If it dies, it's your responsibility. Which means that we have the responsibility for ensuring that life can, can not only survive, but thrive on planet Earth. And that goes against Columbus Day. Columbus Day, which is tomorrow, or as Grandpa R.T. like to say, Columbus Day. Because Columbus was an evil man who was worshipped by white Christianity. Columbus claimed to discover North America. He was arrested for by his own people eventually for the brutality that he inflicted upon American Indians, the genocide that he inflicted upon American Indians. The Arawak Indians, for example, are extinct because of Columbus. They were the original owners of the Bahamas. Now they're gone. because Columbus wiped them out. He enslaved the entire population, the population of people who welcomed him, fed him, his people clothed him, treated him as a brother, and he repaid their kindness with cruelty, brutality, and genocide. And for that, he was prosecuted and imprisoned and died a pauper. And yet today, here in North America, he is still considered a hero. There's still a federal holiday named after him, despite all our efforts to get that changed, because everybody knows it's a lie. He, didn't, he wasn't the first one here. Everybody knows it. He wasn't even the first European here, and everybody knows it. But like Columbus, we have Kit Carson. And I lived next to Carson National Forest for 14 years. I spent years and years and years hunting, fishing, doing ceremony in Carson National Forest. And Kit Carson was a cold-blooded murderer. who took rancid beef to the Navajos, beef with maggots crawling all over it, working as the Indian agent for the federal government. Kit Carson was the one who introduced to the Wild West how to give blankets with smallpox to Indians to wipe them out. Kit Carson tried his level best to exterminate the Navajo Nation. And he almost got away with it. And today he is still touted as a hero. Kit Carson Park in Taos, New Mexico. Carson Cemetery in Taos, New Mexico. The doctrine of Christian discovery teaches people not to respect themselves, not to respect God not to respect the sacredness of life, not to honor Mother Earth, and it is still the primary influence in theology, polity, politics, religion in North America. And so, we think about today how we are reminded that God lives 
here. And God watches us. God knows our heart. God knows whether we respect ourselves. Because, as Proverbs tells us, that's how we know a person's character. How they treat others around them. How they treat the animals. How they treat the ground where they live. How they treat the environment shows whether they respect God in themselves. It's pretty obvious. It's easy to tell. Although there are some that are pretty slick covering it up. They are definitely deceived. And we watch out for them. So we are called by God to be remembered that all human beings are God's children. And the Mother Earth is our home. We have a responsibility to be good stewards of the land, of the animals, of the people. To set a good example for others to follow. And in so doing, inspire people to trust in God and to do right by all the creation. Walk in beauty.